All right. Hello, everyone. Everybody ready? So, um, hello to those of you in the Pacific Nations. It's great to see you. Um, and um, so we have a little bit more ability to go back and forth, do question and answer uh, on my session. Uh, so Sensei Hai will be monitoring that as we go forward. Um, so why don't we uh, bow in and then we'll, uh, we'll get going. So. Okay. All right. So with me tonight, I have uh, one of my senior students, Brian Chesmore. He's going to be my uke. Uh, we're going to do a session tonight that I'm calling Building Better Bunkai. <clears throat> and um, the structure of it will be, uh, we're going to do a fair amount of talking for the first part, and then we'll do a whole bunch of examples. And then towards the end, uh, I hope to do uh, a class participation exercise. I want to see, I'm not quite sure how the timing will work, depending on the number of questions, um, etc. And I've done this class one time before, and I have significantly revised it, so I don't really know how long it takes. <laughs> right? So we're going to do our best here uh, to, 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 to put it all together. Um, I'm going to give you a lot of information and a lot of stuff that you might want to take notes on. Don't take notes. So, because after the presentation tonight, uh, we will put uh, a handout up on Teams that you'll be able to download that has all the key points that I'm going to make uh, about analyzing kata uh, for, uh, for technique. And so that can save you time. You can just focus on what we're doing. All right. So to, uh, to begin, um, I'm going to introduce this uh, with kind of my viewpoint, right? So in my opinion, um, when it comes to things that are inconsistently and poorly understood within karate training, I don't think there's anything worse than the analysis of kata. Um, most practitioners, I want to, I'm going to say, I was going to say many, but I actually think it's most practitioners um, don't really understand the intent of kata fully. Um, I don't think they understand or appreciate how the environment in which kata was built really shapes the way that kata um, manifest as we know them today and also they don't have a process or a system for analyzing kata so everything is sort of starting from ground zero every time you look at a kata what do i do here what am i what should i be thinking about and what i want to do tonight is take you through both a strategic level and a tactical level so the strategic level is going to be things you should keep in mind as you look at kata things that are going to be almost always true um, that you should, like I say, just have in the back of your mind as a, as a lens through which you look at kata when you're trying to analyze for technique. Um, and then the second layer is going to be tactical. And the tactical layer is going to be kind of the checklist, right? Have, have I satisfied this condition? Have I satisfied this condition? What about this? What about this? What about this? And that's, this checklist will help you as well in terms of your analysis for kata. And so the reason I want to talk about this as, as opposed to doing a specific kata um, or doing all, uh, show, demonstrating lots of different bunkai from all of the kata that we have, because that would take two weeks, um, really is to give you a way to think about things so you can do this on your own. Um, kata is the heart of karate, right? It's got the basics in it, it's got combat in it, it's got self-defense in it, it's got spirit, it's got the do aspects of it, it's the stuff that matters most. In my opinion, again, my opinion, if you had to keep only one aspect of karate, and go forward with it, I would keep the kata because everything else is inside it. And so it's really important that we see an understanding of kata when you're taking a don test, all right? And so we want to see good technique. We want to see credible technique that indicates you understand the self-defense aspects of the kata and um, that you understand what's going on in there, okay? All right, so I'm going to start with strategic uh, principles here. So these are things that you should keep in mind when you're analyzing kata for technique. The first thing is, um, and I think everybody notices this, but it's important to bring it out. Kata are almost always asymmetrical, right? They're not the same on left and right. There's a couple, you know, techie shodan, almost symmetrical, but still not quite. And when you see that, um, you know, I think the question arises, why? Um, it really comes back to, I, in my mind, sort of how kata are packaged. 
So you need to have them at a length that's doable. Otherwise, everything is the same length as Supar and Pei, which just takes forever to perform. Um, you have to have it uh, at a length where, and a, and a, and a, uh, and a geometry where you can perform it in a small space. So space uh, today and yesterday in Japan, very much at a premium. Um, so you can't just wander all over the place. And then there's a presentation aspect of this too, uh, particularly from the Japanese side of karate, maybe less so from the Okinawan, but the idea that this should be aesthetically pleasing. So we're not showing every technique uh, from every side. So you might see some things from the right hand, but not the left. Um, and that is usually what happens when they choose, when the author of this kata chooses one side or the other. There is a right-handed bias to kata. And this is really, really important to keep in mind when we do analysis. And I'm going to come back to why this is important later in the talk. Okay? So, um, you know, just as an example of what I'm talking about here, if you think about uh, teki, or sorry, heian nidan. Right, the center portion of that. Right, you have kokutsudachi, kokutsudachi shutoke, kokutsudachi shutoke, osayuke nukite. Right. Well, where's the osayuke nukite on the left side? It's still in there. Okay. So two things to think about is that with this right-handedness, don't ignore the fact that the same thing that you're seeing on the right side could be on the left side, even though it's not shown in the kata. That's important to remember. Okay. Um, another thing to remember about kata is that they are not one long continuous fight. Okay? This gets people into all kinds of trouble when they're trying to analyze a kata. Okay? I'm going to go into how kata are packaged in a second, but the idea that, for instance, in Heian Shodan, I'm fighting this way, and then I'm fighting this way, and I'm fighting this way, and it's all one set of combat, uh, one confrontation is not a good way to think about kata. Okay? What you should think about instead is that kata are packaging up sets of techniques in little smaller packages. Okay? And what they're showing are actually several shorter encounters um, that may or may not be part of a larger confrontation, but it is very definitely not one long fight that starts when you bow in and goes all the way out until the last, uh, until the last technique and then you come back to UI. It is not one fight. Please remember that. So going along with that, excuse me, is the, um, is the question of, well, what's in these packages? When I say that we're packaging up groups of techniques within a kata, what does that mean? So frequently kata have themes or points of emphasis uh, about what they're trying to teach. And I think that's pretty obvious to most people if you haven't thought about it, think about it now right, is that um, different kata teach you different things. And what you should look for within these kata is that some of them are teaching variations on a technique. Um, a good example of a variation might be from kankudai, right, which starts with a very high uh, shuto uke, right, but then also in, has shuto uke in this fashion. Um, you can think about heian nidan again, where you have sh uh, shuto uke in, in kokusachi, going in a straight line. And then you have um, other parts of the kata where it is this way and then at an angle. So what you're demonstrating here is different ways to use the same kind of technique, right? That's one aspect of what you're seeing here. So it's variation on a theme of either the same technique or closely related techniques, right? The second thing that you want to think about is that repetition of technique often represents what we call a fail-safe. So you've gone to perform a particular technique or a particular defense or a counterattack, and it hasn't gone quite the way you wanted it to. There are many kata that have spots in them that show you what you can do. All right. So you've gone to do this, and that didn't do that didn't work. Well, what happens next? The kata has an answer. All right. So sometimes what you'll see is what appears to be a technique that's sort of hanging out there on its own. Like, what do I do with this? Well, that's actually a fail safe for the other technique that was before it, okay? So keep that in mind. That's a thing that you will encounter uh, as you analyze kata, all right? Um, I want to talk for a second, too, about what kata are not, all right? So kata are not karate duels. They are not, not, not fights between two people who know karate and train in the martial arts. They are designed to present what someone who is trained in the martial arts does against an attacker. And 
when you look at your, the techniques that you're pulling out of the kata for bunkai or for oil, they should not be dependent on somebody doing amawashigiri or stepping in and doing a zen kusudachi oizuki. Um, those are not the attacks that are coming at you in the mind of the people who built these kata, right? These are not karate duels. These are not confrontations between martial artists. They are confrontations between a martial artist and an attacker of indeterminate skill, okay? Um, so, uh, so when we think about that then, what are the implications of that? That means that you need to be looking at attacks and defenses against attacks that are not necessarily part of karate, all right? So rather than having linear punches be the only way that people are coming in, you might be defending against big haymaker punches, right? You might be defending against grabs. You might be defending against chokes. You might be defending against lapel grabs, hair pulls, right? All of these things are situations that you should think about being in as you're analyzing a kata, okay? Very, very important to make sure that you're thinking about it that way. Um, so, and, and I guess the best way to think about this is that both the, both the attack from your opponent and the defense that you pull from the kata to show, to demonstrate, to use, right, need to be grounded in the real world. Um, they can't be things that are um, stuff you would just never encounter, right? Like if, you're, if your bunkai is dependent on someone doing, I don't know, uh, three hurricane kicks, right? or uh, a whole bunch of ushirogeri, uh, or something like that, it's probably not the best bunkai. Go back to the table and think about what might be more appropriate, might be a stronger representation of what the kata has to say. Um, one opponent only, all right? I talked about this not being a long, single, continuous battle. You are fighting one opponent, one opponent only, right? And as soon as you get rid of the multiple opponent things, some of the sillier things that I think we see often in videos on YouTube for demonstration um, start to drop away, right? So remember, 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 you are never fighting more than one person at a time, right? An example of the sort of silly technique uh, that I'm talking about is one that drives me absolutely bananas when I see it. And it's a demonstration of kokutsudachi manjuke, right? And they'll show somebody in this position and they're blocking on barai against a kick here and they're defending a punch back here. No emphatically, pardon my French, bullshit, okay, right? That is not what is happening. Um, extra credit, say right now, if we have time at the end, we'll talk about what manjuke normally is when you look at it in kata, because I do actually don't have it as part of this, this class, but if we have time, we can talk about it, because it's one that confuses people a lot, right? So one opponent uh, at a time, and then the second thing is that whatever you're doing, whatever oil you've developed from the kata, needs to finish the fight, right? If you are, if your oil, your bunkai, ends on pure defense, if you end on a, on a, on a defensive move, if you're parrying, um, if you're deflecting, and you're not finishing your opponent, your bunkai is not credible, um, and that can mean that you have picked the wrong set of techniques to think about, or it may mean that you need to go further along in the kata to get to a point where there's an opportunity for finishing techniques, okay? Um, the last thing I'm gonna say here uh, for this section, and then I'll, I'll pause for questions for a second, um, is that strong bunkai, strong oil, right? Things that I look for, so Sensei Hai was talking about things that he looks for in Kihon, which I look for as well. But um, when we talk about things that I look for for bunkai, um, it's okay, I, I recognize that every technique within a kata has multiple interpretations, okay? There's probably one interpretation that the person who built the kata had in mind. If you come up with something that is completely different, but that works, that satisfies these criteria of being realistic, of fighting one person, of finishing the, the fight, um, et cetera, et cetera, that technique is valid. There are no wrong bunkai if they work, right? And if they work, they need to work against real situations, real, real attacks. Um, but the best bunkai that I see are ones that typically are using gross motor skills, right? So big motions that don't depend on a high level of precision, right? So these were built for self-defense techniques. 
you can't very calmly, only, I shouldn't say you can't, the very best of us maybe can, have that sort of zen calm in the middle of a, of a fight where they're going to reach around and take uh, one finger and stick it in between two particular cervical vertebrae to end the fight. Maybe somebody can do that. I can't do that. Most karate can't do that, right? So don't look for techniques that are overly precise. You want to look for techniques where there's actually a little bit of margin of error, okay? Um, Kankudai has a great example of that, which we'll come to in the next section of the class. Um, another thing that you want to do is, whenever possible, is generate a predictable response from your opponent. There are recurring moves in a lot of kata that are designed to do exactly that, and we'll cover that in the next section. So the idea is that when you do this, you put your opponent in a position that they're almost forced to be in. So you know what you can do at that point. The idea is to funnel them into that position and finish the fight. Um, and then uh, I will say like my favorite, this is not mandatory, but for me personally, I love bunkai that work no matter which side things happen on, right? So if it starts from a grab, somebody grabs me on the same side, somebody cross grabs, um, it's the left hand, it's the right hand, whatever. Like if the same bunkai works to address all of that, to me, that's the strongest bunkai, my opinion, right? You've got something that works really well and you should store that for self-defense reference, okay? All right, so let me do, we're gonna, Brian and I are gonna do uh, an example of what I consider to be um, bad bunkai, right? And we're gonna go through why this is bad bunkai. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the first three sections, three passes of Heian Shodan, okay? And I wanna preface this because I think a lot of you are going to have seen this before. You're gonna recognize this and say, oh, we do this as a drill. Is this drill garbage? No, this drill is not garbage, right? What we're gonna do is still very much useful for ma'ai, for distance, for understanding the dynamics between two people, for introducing more junior students to contact with another body, all of those things, for working on technique, um, it has value. Where this, what, I'm gonna, what we're about to show you right now, where it does not have value is as bunkai, okay? So we're gonna take the first uh, three sections, three passes of hand shoulder, and we're gonna tilt it slightly. So I'm gonna be here, Brian, we're gonna, you're gonna start over here. Okay, so this is going to be my left, right? So, uh, right? Okay. okay, so first, and oh, I'm going to, let me apologize right now. So my hip, my left hip is dead. Um, I'm going to yank it out, put a new one in in a couple months. Right now, my stances are very short, all right? So I apologize. Um, don't take the stances here as, uh, as ideal. This is more about how we want to treat the analysis of the kata. Okay, so when we look at Heian Shodan, typically we have the practitioner facing this way and there's an opponent here, and there's an opponent over here, right? And there's probably an opponent here. Like we've all done this drill, or most of us have done this drill. All right, so here's bad bunkai, all right? So the first thing is Brian's gonna step in with right maigiri, I turn to meet it, block it, I step in oizuki chudan, and he retreats, boom. And that's the end of that counter. And then he goes to the other side, you're gonna do right uh, other side kick, right? And now I turn, and I kick here, and then he grabs, other side, if you would, right? I pull this out, I hammer here, I step in punch, and he steps back. Boom, all right? And then we go this way, and Brian goes right-handed kick, right kick, kick, boom, and then I do three blocks, and he does three punches, stepping backwards. Boom, okay? Yummy, thank you. All right? That's terrible, all right? It's a good drill, it's a useful drill for training, contact, for distance, but this is not credible bunkai, all right? It's show, it's multiple attackers. Uh, it's multiple attackers whose distance is not really an issue, right? So if we set up this way, right, Brian, if you do the first uh, position, right? So if Brian's in, in, in the position here where he can get to me now, which he is, and the other person is over here, also ready to get me, by the time I get to this position, Attacker number two is so far out of the picture, it just clearly nonsense. That's not the attack, okay? The other thing that's going on here is it's a karate duel, right? I'm dealing with a maigiri. I'm dealing with a straight punch. We're doing jodanzuki, which I am deflecting this way. And speaking of deflecting, it ends on defense. So I get to here, and I've all I've done is three, three blocks. There's no finish to any of these, right? 
you can make the case that there's a finish on the sides, right, where I get to here, if you'd step in, block. Now I come in here and I, and I punch, and I get, boom, and I get the mother of all Oizuki Chudan. I nail it, I get him right there. I get him right in the solar plexus, and he deflates like a balloon, right? What's your confidence level? You can do that every time. Not high, okay? So what is this stuff, right? And that's what we're gonna go through in the next section. We're gonna look at some of the more basic kata, tactical, tactical considerations and a checklist for thinking about technique, right? But I wanna pause here for a moment and see if there's any questions, because I know I have just dumped a lot of uh, concepts on you. So, any questions? Wow, I've either confused you totally, bored you to death, or I am the most amazing teacher in the world. I'm going with option C. All right, let's go on. Okay, so, tactical considerations. Tools for analyzing kata, all right? We've gone through what kata is, we've gone through what kata is not. Are there things we can look at when we look at individual technique that can help us decide um, what's important and what works and what doesn't? All right, so the first thing we're gonna go, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about right now, and this is the one that I think a lot of people will struggle with, um, is embusen, right? The pattern of the kata and what's that's, what that's for, right? So most of the time, excuse me, a little dry, most of the time, um, we treat this as I'm turning to my left, right? So, Brian, if you're here, hey. right? So, hey, on Shodan, right? I'm turning to deal with this attacker, okay? Don't treat your Endusen like that all the time. In fact, I recommend that you treat it like that very, very little. What I would recommend instead is that this is, the Endusen is not the direction that you turn. It's the direction that you take versus the attack, okay? And so what that means is, instead of me being here and sensing that Brian's going to kick me and me turning, okay, what happens instead is, Brian, if you would come this way, let's just go right about this way, okay? So instead if we're something like this, and Brian does a grab here with the intent of using his other hand to punch me in the head, okay, what if I then use that idea of turning to the left to get to his left? of the ambusen, to move, to use the ambusen to get to his left, to get to the left of the line of the attack. And what you end up with is something that looks like this, okay? So I've still done, essentially, get Amurai, and I've got this, and we think about the next technique, which is Oizuki Chudan. Oizuki Chudan now is not Oizuki Chudan. I've yanked his head down. This is a finishing technique, because I'm gonna step into it. I'm gonna go full body weight, boom, right through his jaw, okay? And then on the turn, just for good measure, I'm gonna take this and dump him, okay? So your technique, instead of being turn, block a, punt, block a kick, punch once, becomes get off line, pull your opponent's head down, blast through their jaw, rip their neck around and dump them on the floor, <laughs> okay? So Endusen, this idea of moving to the direction of Getting to the uh, moving using it to describe the direction you take versus the attack, as opposed to the direction you turn to confront your opponent, is a super critical one. Right? Play with this when you're trying to analyze kata. Look for well, what happens if I get to his left as opposed to turning left. Right? And you'll see this idea, particularly in the hands, it's a great place to start because they all start to the left. Right? And then they all go to the right. And so you have the opportunity there to go to your opponent's left and go to your opponent's right. Right? That's number one. Um, oh, speaking of Ambusen, though, there's another one, too, that I think this is, this is, when I first encountered this idea, I was mulling it. And then there are a few things that really drove this home for me as, like, I think this is correct. Right? This is the way I treat kata. Again, this is Sensei Paul's opinion, right? Paul Bellhouse's opinion. Not everybody may agree, but this is what I believe is, is what we're seeing in kata, is things that go to the back. So if you think about Heian Nidan, Right, uh, Brian, if you would just be here, okay? Right, we have in this, well, right? There's this point here where I get to this position and I do a yoko get a kiage and a back fist, right? Bang, and then I turn around. This better have been the best uraken yoko get a kiage. I, I have to be amazingly confident in this 
to do this. Uh, this is the only thing I'm doing to this opponent who's behind me because I'm turning my back on him. Okay? If you think about it as, again, the Ambusen, if I'm going backwards in the kata, right, I'm here and now I'm going backwards. Backwards means I'm going to his back. Okay? Just like when I turn to the left, it means I'm going to his left. So if I go to his back now, and the kata doesn't really tell you how you get there, but that's okay. You can make that work, right? So if I get to his back, right, this no longer an uraken, this no longer a, a, a yoku genekiyage chudan, collar grab, okay? Knee strike, takedown. All of a sudden that makes a lot more sense than turning around after doing two of the lighter techniques we have and then turning away from your opponent, okay? So I think there's a lot to be said here about this concept of the embusen being against the angle of attack, not the direction you turn, right? That's number one. Um, and again, there will be a handout with all of this stuff. Okay, um, the other thing, another thing I wanna talk about is not being limited by the names of the techniques um, that you're seeing, right? Don't think about blocking, all right? Um, everything, you, I, you're better off taking an offensive um, perspective on all of, on all of the, um, the techniques we have here. So, Brian, if you went over here, right? So, if we think about um, Heian Shodan, right? So, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I'm in this position. Uh, Brian grabs my hand, right? If this is no longer me blocking him as he's punching, stepping backwards, insert eye roll here, right? If you think about this instead as that, okay, that's a much different idea. All of a sudden you have three of those in a row, that's a finishing technique. You're not ending on defense. That's credible bunkai, okay? So don't be caught up in, well, this says it's a block. That's for convenience. Look at the motion and what you can do with the motion as opposed to necessarily saying it's a block, it's not a block, it's a punch, it's not a punch, okay? Um, the other thing is consider the whole motion, all right? So when we do the bad version of this bunkai, right? I went here, and uh, so you just do a right kick for me. Boom, boom, all right? Now as I step in, he's punching and I'm blocking, right? This hand back here is not doing anything. Same thing on the next one, not doing anything, right? What's this hand doing? Okay, there's a pretty good rule of thumb, um, I think anyway, that if you have a limb that is not part of any technique you're doing, and this goes for kihon, this goes for everything. If you have a limb that's just along for the ride, you're missing something, right? So if we go back to what I would consider to be good bunkai with this, again on the grab, right? As I drive in and get to here, actually let's go this way, right? As I get to here, hikite becomes very important. Right? I'm pulling him into the technique. The other thing is if I do this suddenly, just relax, I won't do this too hard. Right? See what happens? Chin comes up, opening up the target, which is what I want. Okay? So don't forget about this stuff. Right? Look for opportunities to include the hikite because that will be important in terms of generating good, powerful uh, bunkai. Okay? Thank you. All right. Um, okay. The other thing in here, too, is, I mentioned this um, earlier, is the idea that you'll see multiple versions of the same technique. Um, so Heian Nidan has a whole bunch of shuto, right? But I'm going to come back again to this idea of, um, uh, of fail-safes, which we talked about um, briefly. All right, so this section here, we have three of these ageukes or agetes, however we want to talk about it, right? And if the first one is into the throat, well, what are, what are we doing the other two for, okay? And this is what I was talking about with fail-safes. Quite often when you see multiple iterations of the same technique, it's because it's helping you address what's gone wrong on one of your previous attempts. All right, so Brian, go here. All right, so we're gonna do the, the, the where you deflect. Hey. Okay, actually, let's go this way a little bit. Okay, so we start here, Brian's got in, intent to do me harm, right? I step in and I start to drive this into his throat, and he sees what's coming, and so he's going to deflect it. He's going to push my elbow off, okay? Well, I'm in here now, right? What I'm going to do is I'm going to try again. I get to here, and he's going to get this one, right? And now on this third one, what you'll notice is see how his posture is starting to deform, okay? 
I'm starting to win the battle because I'm bringing my weight in and it's easier for me to go forward than for him to go backwards. And so on number three, there's your winner. Okay? You have a similar idea in techie, uh, sorry, hey on, need on using shoot though, which I'm not going to demonstrate here, but the exact same idea. I try here, it gets blocked. I try here, it gets blocked. I get to here and I'm in. Okay? So when you see multiples, right, if you're demonstrating this, what I would suggest is if you're looking at this part of the kata, I'm not really interested in necessarily seeing all three done the same way, right? This to me is, as a, as a, as a blow into the throat, that's good technique. And then if you have a senior student, you say, well, what are the other two, right? Then they can talk about fail safes and they can talk about other ways to approach um, what you're seeing here. But this idea of a fail safe is very, very important. Um, it's in a lot of kata, it's in a lot of kata. Um, if you see the same technique um, scattered throughout um, the, the, the uh, kata. I'll come back to Hei Anid on here. Um, teki, uh, kokutsudachi shuto uke is all through um, Hei Anid on, right? So the first one is about sort of this fail-safe, this idea of confronting somebody straight in. Let's, let's take this for a spin, all right? Brian and I have not practiced when I'm sort of spinning this on him, right? So if I go to here with the idea of, tech, uh, of, of going to here, right? So he grabs, right, and I get to here, and he blocks, so push the elbow, okay? And I'm gonna do the same thing, I'm gonna come over, and he's gonna get the second one, but I'm driving him backwards, and then we get to the third, and I'm in, okay? So this is using multiple shuto uke in, in a straight line, okay? Later in the kata at the end, right, we see one, and then we see 45, okay? That can be another way of delivering your shuto, okay? So it can be, uh, let's see, so if we go the same, same setup, if I go to here and he blocks, boom, all right, I can go to the side, get to here and go outside, okay? The other ones were all inside, this one is inside and then outside, okay? So, shuto, same technique, variations, right? So when you see the same thing in the kata, this is the kind of thing you want to think about, right? Variations on the technique, okay? Um, Here's another one that's going to be really important when you think about uh, analyzing kata. And this is the fact that kata are, as I mentioned in the beginning, right-handed. Okay? So <laughs> when you are analyzing something, um, particularly say the heians, right? Because the heians go left, and then they go right. Okay? And this left side is left-handed. Right side is right-handed, and then it goes up the middle, which is also right-handed. Okay, it puts this first pass at a disadvantage, right? If you look at something like, um, oh gosh, let's see, Heian, really any of the hand cut, but Heian Nida is a good example, right? So I've gone here, one, two, and then I've stopped. And then this one goes here, one, two, and then it goes to here, one, one, two, three, four, okay? You may be better off starting your analysis not on the first pot, on the first side. Start in the first place that the kata becomes right-handed. Okay, so going to the right and then to the back and up the middle will give you more to play with. Okay, uh, because if your tying passes together, excuse me, if your tying passes together, this little one off to the left to start the kata is kind of an orphan. It doesn't go anywhere. So they show the left side, and then they don't show what comes out after it. They go over here and they show the right side, and then they show what comes out after it. So you may be better off when you're looking at your kata, like I say, find the part where the kata becomes right-handed. Okay? And this is that. Um, turns is another point that you want to think about. Um, turns are often takedowns, right? And jumps are, or I should be take, takedowns or throws. Jumps are often throws, um, and they're usually lifting throws. Okay? So if we look at hand shodan again, um, if we look at the bunkai, it's not this and stop, followed by a turn that doesn't really do anything, and then a this and this and this, right? The break is actually after the turn. So if we go here again, Brian goes to, uh, tilt for me this way, Brian? Thank you. Right, so Brian goes to punch, I yank him down, right? I step through punch, boom, and I go to here, and then this is my turn, right? So this turn here to throw him down is my second, um, yeah, because, uh, get on okay? If you come over here, right? This is now where you can take 
That's one little package. Here's another package, okay? So now he grabs, and I get to here, slam into the, into the neck or the collarbone, and now I'm driving in, all right? And then I can possibly, if I wanted to, um, take this and chop in into my next data right. So when you look for breaks between little clusters of technique, they're not always where they seem like they might obviously be, right? So the break is not here, right? The break is here after this technique. So the, the turn itself becomes part of the, um, the application, and you need to consider it as you look at developing your bunkai. Probably need a quick drink. Okay. All right. This is another one I want to talk about <coughs> that is super important. And it's the idea of generating a predictable response. All right. And I mentioned that it shows up in all kinds of kata. And as soon as I show this to you, you'll be like, oh, yeah, that's everywhere. <laughs> okay. The one we want to use here is actually um, from Heian Nidan. Um, it shows up in a version in Teki Shodan, off the top of my head. It shows up in Kankudai, um, several others, right? So typically, if you get in front of me, right? So typically we show the bunkai for, um, for uh, Kokusa Shutuke. We do Osa, you uh, do a punch for me, right? Osa Yuke. And then I step in Zen Kusudachi and I nail him right here, right? And I kill him with the spear hand, right? Eh, possible. Again, how confident are you? that you can do that, that you can get your fingers straight, that you can drive this in with enough force to make a difference and not hit chest and bone and not hit muscle wall in the stomach. If he's fit, this isn't doing much of anything, okay? You go to the neck, that's lethal, right? Is this, is this really what we're doing? Um, I would say no, okay? So what I think we're doing instead is, um, if let's do this off of, uh, Let's just do this off of, off of grab, okay? So this idea here, this motion, is again gonna generate a predictable response. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring him down. You can leave it up, okay? So I'm gonna bring him down into the elbows. There's my Osayuke, okay? And now as I drive, again, this gives me the option to drive in the throat, or I can make this into a takedown here, okay? So this, this combo here, you see it in, um, in the techies, right? Here, right, this shows up a lot. This idea of a predictable response. So if he grabs, right, I know I can get his head down here. Very, sorry, very quickly, all right? I get to it very quickly, right? That's what you want. Same thing from the bunkai that I showed you for Heian Shodan, right? Predictable response. I know where his head is. I know exactly where his head is. And you'll notice I'm taking him from here to here. If you think about kata, Jodanzuki doesn't really show up. Head punches show up, but Jodanzuki doesn't really show up in many kata. Doesn't mean you're not punching to the head. You're punching to the head, but you're doing so because you've generated a predictable response. You've pulled them down and so that you can punch them. Okay? Um, let's see here. So we already talked a little bit about the, the, full, the full motion. Um, I will say that... Um, all right, sorry, that was an incomplete thought. We already talked about the full motion when we looked at uh, Age Uke, right? So it was the idea that Brian grabs, right? And I get to here, and I use this as part of the technique. The hikite is part of the technique. Keep that in mind. Related to that, so, so, so in your head, right, a closed hand coming back to the body, you should think about, does that have something in it? Because it probably does, okay? Again, most people aren't going to fight like this. Why do we train like this? It's because this hand is doing something. Pull, pull, right? It can absolutely be part of kihon to generate power, to help you have proper hip technique, right? But more importantly, it's about application. Grab, pull, drive your technique so you're pulling someone into whatever attack you're using, right? Related to that is the idea that if you're touching your own body in any way, like cup and saucer, I think is a good one, um, you more than likely, again, have something of your opponent in your grasp, okay? Uh, if you would go over here, right? So from here, if he, uh, if he grabs, uh, yeah, that's not gonna work. Okay, if he grabs here um, and I pull, actually, let's do this, grab, grab here, right? We get to here, right? And I'm gonna step back, right? Look over a second, hand you on, right? Trap, oh, 
predictable response again. Okay, pull this back. This becomes either groin, bladder wall, knee, and this part of the cut to stay right there. Let go. Okay, touching yourself, touching your own body. Something from my opponent is in between those pieces. Okay, so this is not, for instance, somebody going, stay up, right, going, ha, ah, no. <laughs> right, right, look for opportunities. You have hands together, if you have hand and elbow together, more than likely part of your opponent is between those two hands. Okay, in this case it's the wrist, right, as I yank him down here and then I clean this up and then I go in here and now it's in between the elbow and the palm. Okay, so if you have contact with your own body, you generally have something of your opponents trapped in between. One more point. Um, other styles can help you analyze kata. Okay, so kankudai is one I'm going to talk about here for a second. <coughs> Excuse me. If you get stuck on something that just looks weird, like what is that? Scroll around. YouTube's a wonderful, wonderful device. Um, I got. I was just kankudai. Right. Starts here. Goes here. Right. What is that? Right. I think we've all heard it's the night fighting kata, and so you're blocking a backlight. Sure. That could be a thing. That's pretty oddly specific, though. I hate to. I, I have a hard time believing that a kata was built around that exclusively. Can it be used that way? Certainly, right? If you look at our kankudai, so from the side, here, here, right? Look at some of the older versions of this. Look at koskun, look at kushanku, right? They're not upright. They do this. Oh. That's interesting. What could that be? Well, what if we made, if you come this way, what if we made night fighting less about backlighting and being in a really dark environment? And you're not really sure, I know I have a problem, but he's wearing dark clothes, he's got a mask on, and I can sense movement, and I think he's gonna hit me, right? What if this was, take a, uh, do a left, uh, left hook punch. Does that look like Shanku? Okay. Next move, here. Get to here. Where's the head? That's the head. There's the arm, okay? I haven't seen anything, but I know there's a head here. It's gonna be on one end of this arm or the other. I get to here, right? What's the next move? Here, one. Bang. Trap, because now I know where the hand is. And you do a nice high shuto. This is the gross motor movement I was talking about. I can't see. I'm not going to try to get him with a fingertip. I'm going to take anything between the base of my pinky and my elbow. Boom. Sorry. <laughs> to, get in, to get into the neck, right? This works. This works. This works. All of this works, right? So what you end up with is program flinch. Boom. Now I know where the hand is in the head. I'm going to trap the hand and hit the head. Okay? I would posit that that's probably... A better baseline example than backlight. Okay, better explanation for why it's called the night fighting kata. Okay, so I'm going to pause here, um, and what I'd like to do is just answer any questions to start, and then what we're going to do is Brian and I are going to go through <coughs> a. Uh, what are we doing on time? Oh, perfect. Okay, we're going to go through, and you guys can join us. We're going to go through an example of some analysis that we did in class the other day with Hang On Sundan. And so what we did is I came in and I had a set of techniques that I felt pretty decent about, but honestly was not in love with. And so we took the class. And we're like, you guys know the rules because I tell them these rules all the time, these tool, this toolbox. And I said, Look, let's play with this. And so we crowdsourced and we actually came up with things that I like a lot better. I now have a set for a part of a kata that I have always hated my own bunkai for. I've never been like, eh, it's probably this. I'm actually at the point now where like, I'm pretty, I'm almost positive this is what I think this is. So we're going to go through that. But before we get to it, any questions? Any questions? Oh, all right. <laughs> okay. So we're going to go through the very beginning of Heian Sandan, right? And Heian Sandan, I think for a lot of people, is a very problematic kata, right? It's got some unusual moves in it that, you know, kind of like this in, 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 in Kankudai, don't really seem like... They're all that, prime. like, what is this? Why am I doing this, right? So I remember learning this kata originally back when I was in Shotokan. And again, it was this idea of um, 
if you would go left foot forwards on Kutachi, you step in Oizuki Chudan, like I would block here. And then for some reason, I'm going to bring both my feet together and step closer to my opponent, and I'm going to hit him this way. What? No. Why am I doing that, right? There's no advantage to me of doing this, right? So when we look at this piece, we want to remember the toolbox, okay? So we're going to start not with going left. We're going to start with going right because this is the first, this is where the cut that becomes right handed. So you're going to go on the other side, okay? That's number one. The second thing we're going to do is we're going to think about the kind of attack. It's not going to be a karate duel. So Brian is not going to step in and do, oh, it's okay, chew on, right? He's going to grab my wrist with the intent of bashing me with his other hand. Okay, so what I'm going to do, and actually, Brian, why don't you uh, go to here? Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my Sen. At this point in the kata, I turn to the right. Well, I'm going to get to the right of the line of attack. Okay, so he's going to swing, and I'm going to get to here. Okay, I'm out of danger. Right? Now, why do I want to stand up? Could that be part of the technique? I think so. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take this arm... And as I stand up, I'm going to pull it down, and I'm going to jam this up into his elbow. Don't worry. <laughs> You're a little worried. Okay? Relax. Relax. Okay? And I'm going to hyperextend it or break it. Right? So that's my first move here. Right? And now there's a reason for me to stand up because I'm down in this position, and I'm going to yank this down, and I'm going to try to drive this hand up, wham, as hard as I can. Right? Now, scoots this way. Right? Maybe that hasn't ended the fight, right? Probably hasn't, if he's, if he's all drunk or high or whatever. So, next move in the kata, I'm here, right? I'm here. Next move is here. I'm going to sweep this out of the way and use that into the neck, okay? Here, here's where I am. Next move of the kata is I turn and I do morote uke. Right? Well, again, don't be trapped by the name. Don't be trapped by the name. So I've swept this, I've punched here, right? What if I use this to grab and I'm going to shoot this through, pulling this way? Okay? Stay there. Here. Next move in the kata, osayuke, followed by zen kusnachi nukite. Okay? Pull them down. This, I think, is supposed to be the end. I get into here. I just bring this across the back of the neck, and I do whatever I want to. And it's something that I actually shown in the kata, right? Here's where I think we have a fail safe. Can you come this way, Brian. Right? Okay. What's the natural reaction for somebody in this position? I'm gonna try to stand up, right? Maybe he's stronger than I am, and he starts to stand up. Okay. Freeze there. Okay. Next move of the kata. Bang. Next move of the kata. Drive in. Grab the chin. Right here. And I'm stepping behind. I'm not gonna do this because. This is our living room, right? Right, And that's a takedown. Okay, so what you've got now is you've gone from something that depends on this weird idea that you're going to step into your opponent, give up all your balance by putting your feet together, and use two weak techniques, apparently to the throat and the groin, I guess. I don't freaking know, right? And then you have some other stuff that's disconnected. Now, by thinking about the Ebusen in the way we've talked about, by thinking about non-karate attacks, by thinking about not being stuck with the name, and by thinking about fail-safes, I think this is pretty good, personally. I mean, we have a little bit of pride of ownership, right? <laughs> like, right? But I think this is right, okay? So that's, um, I think we're almost at the end here. I know I've dumped a lot of information, but um, I, I, I want you guys to take this toolbox, I will the, the handout will be loaded up to Teams, and start to think about it, okay? Um, don't let this create pressure for you, all right? Because all of a sudden, you'll be like, wow, this is, maybe this is very different than the way you've been doing Munkai. Am I going to fail my next test? No, okay? Start to think about this, right? Play with this stuff. I'm happy to have conversations. I love this. This stuff totally jazzes me. So if you want to have conversations about it on Teams or by WhatsApp or what have you, I'm happy to have those conversations too. Um, and lastly, I will say that, um, again, disclaimer, this is Paul Belisle's view of, of the Bunkai world. I think it holds together. There may be people who disagree or want to pick at uh, certain aspects of it or, or have other things to add. Um, I would encourage you to listen to them. But hopefully what I've shown you tonight holds together, both from a strategic standpoint, things you need to remember about Kata when you go into them, as well as a tactical toolbox 
What are the things I need to be checking for? What should I be looking at as I go through a kata, right? Embusen, credibility of technique. Don't end on defense. Make sure there's a finishing technique. Don't be trapped by the names. Take those and play. Because honestly, at least for me, this is my favorite part of kata, uh, favorite part of karate in general. All right, so I'll stop there. We have just another minute. If anybody has any last second questions, happy to take them. Everybody's been, I think, like I say, either bored or blown away and not quite sure what to do, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, so people want a break. I get it, I get it. All right, so we're gonna pause here. We'll take a 10 minute break and we'll come back at the uh, top of the hour and Sensei Mina will be closing out, so we'll bow out. All right, here we go. All right. Shotsuke. Hey. Arigatou gozaimashita. Thank you very much.